Thank you, Patricia. Thank you all. Um, the problem is that Patricia said the essential. So I can just recapitulate what she said before me uh, in much worse English. So, but anyway, I promise to give a certain introduction in Edith Marion's biography, and I will do it for the next 60 or 70 minutes. Um, I must say that there was a profound biography before uh, Rex Raab, well-known architect and researcher of Edith Marion, published a book about her in 1993. So in fact, I was not the first one who wrote about Edith Marion, but the simple reason I did it was that I, in a way, wanted to focus on her co-workership collaboration with Uda Steiner. So Rex Raab is a whole, was designing a whole biography, especially also about childhood and youth. And the first time she worked in London, lived in London. But my, to be honest, my only interest was uh, what she did in Donach. And in so far, I wanted to go a little bit deeper and more in detail um, what happened there in her collaboration with Steiner. And um, in fact, uh, Rex Saab was the first who discovered uh, the whole extent of, we can also say the friendship in between Steiner and, and Edith Marion. So he wanted to see the correspondence in the Steiner archive and before it was not available. So the letters were there, but in a way they were preserved or even secured or even I don't know, they were not open to the public. But Rex, Rex Raab was quite um, powerful in saying, I need, I need to see them. So finally, he, he got a chance to see them. But as far as I understood, this was also a decision of the Steiner Nachlass Verband to publish everything. In a certain way, because now uh, Raab found the, the correspondence. And so there was no more, let's say, secret protection. Uh, and a little bit the shocking event was um, at this time for most of uh, the anthroposophists who worked there, that it was such an intimate relationship. It was such a nearness, such a kind of loving story on another level than it is popular, but it was really there. So part of this intimate correspondence and collaboration is in the book of Rex Raab, and I want to I want to underline it a little bit more because I was especially interested in what happened in between those two individualities in those years. So I want to start my storytelling um, effort tonight with the situation when Edith Marion came to see first Rudolf Steiner. And in fact, I believe, or I can almost prove that Rex Raab is not correct in dating, because he described a very wonderful situation, which probably never happened, but it's wonderful. He described that she, Edith Marion, heard Rudolf Steiner's lecture in Berlin, 14th of May in 1912. Um, and this is a very special lecture because it was the second time Dr. Steiner described the forthcoming challenge to sculpt the Christ. So, um, six days before, 8th of May in 1912, he first time in Cologne um, was describing a new challenge to bring the real image of Christ to humanity in the forthcoming time. And second time, six days later, he did it in Berlin. And from a certain point of view, uh, Ra believed to know that uh, Edith Marion was in the room. I can show in the book that it's not true, presumably not true. But anyway, let's start with this situation. Because if she was not in the room, which I believe, or she was quite near to Berlin, from a spiritual point of view, maybe it's not so tremendously decisive. But what Steiner said in this lecture, I want to quote it. He said, Yes, even the outer represented, representation of the image of Christ, the way he is to be shown in an outer image, is a question that still needs to be solved. Many feelings will have to go through human souls on earth 
if the many attempts which have been made through the ages are to be joined by one who which will to some extent show what the Christ is, a supersensible impulse coming to live in earth evolution. The attempts made so far do not even have the beginnings of this. And to shorten it a little bit, it's a longer quotation. I think you, most of you will know that Steiner described more or less that the image of Christ or the face of the Christ at the turning point of time was characterized by three forces and they were really forming, forming his head. He said there is a force of wandering uh, and it's creating the whole image of the forehead. And there was a strong force of empathy and love. And this has to do with the middle part of the face. And there is a strong force of conscience. And this was around the mouth. And the, the, so this, this, this lower, lower aspect of his, his outer face. And then he's describing that from these three foldness, these three forces, the whole other body was shaped. And so he's describing the challenge to create a new image of the Christ, primarily the face, das Angesicht, as we say in German, but from this uh, streaming out to the whole body. It's a very wonderful description. And as you are all anthroposophists, I, I think you will more or less all know it. But we can, as I mentioned, show that Edith Marion was not in the room in Berlin. Anyway, she was on the way to Steiner. Uh, just to summarize um, the years before, she was a well-trained professional sculptor. She came from England, very English and very wonderful um, woman, living alone, an esoteric seeker, we can say, a brilliant person from uh, but outwardly and inwardly as well. And um, she was committed to an esoteric crew uh, since 1909. Uh, Stella Matutina was the name of this crew when it was part of the Golden Dawn. Uh, one was a crucial esoteric group in London, but the leader of the crew, and he's also his, his, the second leader, they were linked to Steiner. So in a certain way, they were fully aware of what is anthroposophy evolving in Middle Europe. So Dr. Falkin, the, the Rosicrucian doctor who was leading the Golden Dawn and also his colleague, Mikan. So in a certain way, they were not just doing their own thing. They were have a relationship to Steiner. And we know that Edith Marion uh, heard a lot about of anthroposophy before she decided to go to Europe. And she was then in 1912, 40 years old, because she was born in, in England in 1872. So in 1912, she had a plan to go to Europe and to Italy and from Italy to Egypt. And in fact, it was an esoteric journey. And in fact, she was searching the master, her master. And by a kind of inner experience, she stopped in Milano and she came back to look, to go to Germany. And she was on the way to Rudolf Steiner and she asked with letters to get a date, a personal encounter, but she got no answers. Okay, I just wanted to say she made several efforts to, to see Dr. Steiner, but it wasn't so easy because she got no answer. And then another colleague of her, Harry Collison from London wrote to Mary Steiner. And finally, probably she got a first encounter. I think it was end of December, 1912 in Berlin. And also she heard the first lecture there. Um, it, was not, it was not this about the forthcoming sculpture, but it was a Christological lecture in Berlin, also with Lucifer and Ariman. <clears throat> but mo more important than the lecture because she couldn't really understand Dr. Steiner, her, her German capacities were very, very limited, almost not existent at this moment. But the first encounter with Steiner together with Mary Steiner and uh, was a conversation. And Mary Steiner translated if Dr. Steiner needed a translation because he was, 
he, he did not like to, to speak English, but he was able to understand it. And one time he really translated himself, um, um, the person who, who was leading the Theosophical Society, Annie Besant in Berlin in 1902. So Steiner's, he had capacities, but he usually did not speak English. So they had a first conversation and obviously he invited her for a second one um, some days later in Cologne. So she went from Berlin to Cologne and this is in so far a decisive moment because what happened in Cologne at the, the turning point from 1912 to 1913 was the founding of the Anthroposophical Society. So it was a step out of the Theosophical Society and the new beginning of the Anthroposophical Society. And by destiny or by, I would say by destiny, she was, she was part of it and heard all those lectures Dinah's given there and had a second, a, second, um, a second personal conversation with him. And then after this second conversation, which was probably last day of the year 1912, she wrote a letter to him from a hotel in Cologne. I think you must be too busy to grant me another interview. So she, she, she began her letter to Steiner, but I do want to, and, and you, I, want, I want you to ask two questions. So I will write them. You said yesterday, so this was the second interview, the second uh, meeting in Cologne. You said yesterday, I was more developed occultly than I can bring through in this incarnation. Does that mean in consequence of some fault I have committed or because there is some other kind of work for me to do? For some years, I have always felt there is something definitive for me to do and that sometimes I shall meet the master who will tell me what it is and explain some of the things which, I have, pus which have puzzled me so much. For a long time I searched and I thought perhaps it was Abdul Baha who would be the right person. But when I met him, although I liked him so much, I knew he was not the person I was looking for. Then I thought it possibly might be you. And when I saw you in Berlin, I knew at last I was right about the master. There remains only the second point. Is there really a definite thing for me to do? Or do I only imagine it? If there is, may I know how, what it is? I think the time has come for me to know if it is so, but I'm quite sure you will know best. And if I may have some of my models cleared up or must still wait. Believe me, yours sincere, sincerely, Edith Marion. So a very touching letter. I think the, the, the name of the hotel in, in Cologne was Basel. So kind of a destiny hotel for her. She asked, and you heard, he said in the, in the personal interview that she's developed on an, on, on an esoteric level, but she will never in this life can incarnate this potential fully. And she asked herself, why is this due to a mistake in the former biography or what? And then the second point, this feeling that there is, that there is such a clear, a, clear, a clear task. Probably he never, he never answered this letter. You, 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 don't, you should not think that Steiner answered all letters. Maybe you are frustrated sometimes if you send emails or letters to Dornach or to other places in the world and getting no response, which is very, very sad. But in fact, even our teacher, Dr. Steiner, was not able in responding all the time. And um, so some of them, they had to wait, even if we can't really understand why an Edith Marion had to wait for an answer. Maybe the time was not right for this answer. Anyway, 
no answer and she left Cologne and she went back to London. Of course, she had many more experiences in listening to Steiner in Berlin, in being in Cologne and witnessing the foundation of the Anthroposophical Society. But anyway, anyway she went home. And then there is a very no, another very, um, very deeply moving letter from her from England. Um, and this letter is dated the 30th of March in 1913. So that means exactly 12 years before Dr. Steiner died. And she, in this letter, announced to him that she came to a certain inner decision, um, being not the answer to her questions, but an inner decision. I think she wrote to him, perhaps, I ought to inform you that I have now quite definitively decided in my own mind that when I leave England in May, it will be all together and with your permission, I hope to entirely cast in my lot with the Anthroposophical Society. When I know more, I hope it may be possible for me to do some work for it. So she announced that she is willing or this, she decided to connect her lot, her destiny with the destiny of the society. And she still thinks that there is a kind of work which has to be done. So it was for her a deep esoteric step to connect, to unite her destiny with the one of the society. And in a certain way, uh, she brought herself and her work to Steiner's disposal. And how to say, I mean, many of us joined the society in different uh, moments of our biographies, but this kind of decision together with the full consciousness to bring in her work and looking for a special task which is waiting for her. This was so clear in herself, um, but no answer. In one of the first letters she have sent to Steiner, she, she integrated in the letter a photograph of a kind of a Christ statue she, she did in London. It was the sculpture was named the seeker of divine wisdom. So in a, in a way she offered her work and she offered herself, but she had to, she had to live with this kind of uncertainty. This was, I said, 30th of March in 1913. And then she went to Den Haag, to The Hague, to the Netherlands, where Steiner gave a wonderful Easter course about the inner development of human beings. Uh, a very famous course, I think most of you will know. And she took part and who, here in The Hague, she heard her first esoteric lesson because Steiner directly took her in his esoteric school because this was no question in her case. She was so developed, occult, not many of those disciples or friends of the society at these times were so developed at S. Aiden Marion. And then she went to Germany, especially to learn German um, and to help where she can help. And we know that she came almost the same time to Munich as Adolf Hitler. This is in a certain way very shocking. She came in May, in May 1913 to Adolf Hitler and she lived more or less next street. For me, it was important to find it out because in a certain way what she did is to help Steiner in sculpturing the Christ between Ariman and Lucifer, you know, the evil, and this other man, also a little artist. He was a little artist coming from Vienna to bring all evil over Germany, Europe and the world. So they came to the same city, the same date, more or less, I think two weeks between and the same part of Munich they were living. 
I mention it not because to saying a sensational element, but in a, in a certain way, Munich at these, in these years was a decisive city. In a certain way, it was a prepared city for the mystery dramas. So Wagner was fully incarnated in Munich and Steiner wanted to bring it to another level. But Munich in a certain way never accepted the mystery place and never accepted the first Goethe Arnim there. Steiner wanted to have it in this Munich but it was not possible. And in fact, he had to go to Switzerland. But Munich was in a certain way, uh, there was a predisposition to have it there. This is a deeper, deeper, deep, deeper question why, but anyway, she came to Munich and it was the last year, the fourth year of the mystery dramas and she helped and she, uh, yeah, she learned English and uh, German and so on, but at the end, she can't afford any any more to stay in in Germany because the money was out. So in August 1913, in Munich, she wrote another letter to Steiner. There were other letters between, more about esoteric exercises, but these are more biographical letters. She was always doing the exercises Steiner gave to the esoteric pupil, and she she had inner experiences and she. She, in the correspondence, she wrote to him about these meditation, meditative experiences. But then there is another biographical element on her way to Dornach, August 1913. I can only afford to study and reflect until the second week in September. By that date, I must find some definitive work to do or be forced to return to England there is a feeling that perhaps there may be something for me to do here. So I will not go back unless absolutely obliged. You will see that it is necessary for me to come to a conclusion about the kind of work I will do during the rest of my life. And I do want some advice. So forgive me if I ask you, if you will tell me what you think, I will try to carry it out in and any way possible for me to do so. Your pupil aided Mary. So it's getting really hard. I mean, and maybe you think why, I mean, Dr. Steiner could easily give the, the answer and saying, hello, aided Mary, and you are the one who has to do with me, the Christ sculpture, good you, that you are here. But in fact, obviously it was not so easy. But some weeks later, there was the foundation stone for the first Goethe Arnhem, 20th of September, this prominent address of Dr. Steiner. And then he went to Norway, to Christiania, to give the whole cycle about the fifth gospel. So it was a very decisive time for the development of the hill in Dornach. And she was prepared, as I said. She could afford to stay a little bit longer in Munich and then coming to Berlin. And in Berlin, she heard about the Dornach project, but not by Steiner, by another artist, Tadeusz Richter from Poland. And he said there were co-workers needed in Dornach and she went to Dornach by this little advice. And then she was in Dornach January, February, 1914. She lived together with Elisabeth Frede, her friend. Uh, and it's good that there will be a talk about Frede in autumn. And, um, but still not knowing what is her principal work there. Um, and if, if she is really needed. Um, and again, a letter to Steiner. I did not say anything about them. No, I did not say anything about the most important thing I had in mind, which is if there is anything to give better understanding of the mystery of Golgotha. If only I could, I would not find life and the isolation as hard as I do nor would I have such silly and feeble thoughts about it. 
So she asked for advice about a deeper understanding of the mystery of Golgotha in a letter. And she got ill in Donach, uh, tuberculosis, and went home to England and got worse in England, age of 42. It was maybe a decisive point in her life, very close to death. And she wrote a letter to, Di to Steiner from London, pleading the beloved teacher for spiritual and medical help. I would ask you therefore to send me a met message. I need a bit more strength to go on or to go through the gate of death. It is so very hard without you, but I wish to do what is my destiny if I can find it. I once hoped to help a little later on, but this hope is now fading. Steiner helped by advice from the distance, also by medical advice, and she survived this major crisis, and then she came back, and then we are in the springtime, summer or autumn, we don't know exactly, of 1914, and they started their work together for the Christ statue between Lucifer and Ariman. So as you all know, this huge sculpture with this cosmic struggle, man or the representative of man in between Lucifer and Ariman. And they started in maybe autumn, we don't know exactly, Mirella Falde knows best in, in Donach. Um, but even if we don't know the date exactly, it was the beginning World War I. Beginning of the First World War, maybe it was the time to start. It sounds a little bit strange, but art on the level of Dr. Steiner is never um, just say we would like to do art. So it had, it had a relationship to the ongoing history of Middle Europe and the world. And this Christ in between these powers of evil had to do with the signature of that time. But now Edith Merriam was really on her place. Maybe this last crisis with this disease and with this inner question, how to get a deeper understanding of the mystery of Golgotha, maybe it was all necessary. Maybe Dr. Steiner could not give just the answer. Um, we all know that sometimes in, li in life situation, we have no answers and maybe also Dr. Steiner had no answers, but life is evolving and we need confidence, we need trust that the answer is coming by the development of life and in relationship to what happens around. So it's not only our single individual decision what, what to do best, but to see what is needed. Viktor Frankl said, this is the sense of our human biography that in every moment we'll find what we have to do. There is a, an individual answer to an individual voice but this voice is not always calling, but we have to listen what is needed, what has to be done by us now. And this is the sense of the life in a certain way, the, the sense, the meaning of life, to find what, what has to be done by me now. And sometimes we can't see it, but then we have to wait or to undergo inner and outer procedures. So now they started and it is touching that in 1915, so the second year of the, the World War in May, we know that they started together to work on a bigger sculpture. It's the sixth draft design. They started very small. You can see it in Donach in the, in the, in the high ceiling studio that they started with this size, but then it's getting two meters. And this sixth model they, 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 they signed it together for the first time. It's there on the sculpture, Edith Mary and Rudolf Steiner. So both names together. Um, and as Patricia said at the beginning, um, we have some memories of those who were also in Donach describing Edith Merriam. And the most of these very precise memories are from Asya Turgenieva from Russia. 
Asya was herself a brilliant artist, not an English one, right? Russian. And uh, she described quite, quite uh, as I said, in detail, uh, the situation of Edith Marion. They had also a kind of friendship from the distance. And Edith Marion was a person where almost everybody was in distance. She kept distance. Um, and she was also in a, in a way uh, a person which was not such easy to go there and to hack her. And um, so there was a kind of seriousness, a kind of elegance, a kind of spiritual awareness. I would also say a kind of esotericism, esotericism but also of beauty, where the other ones they kept a little distance without any COVID uh, and other measures. So just to see that you can't just come and, and hug her. And the studio where Edith Marion was working was a kind of a um, sacred space with diner because there is not everybody coming in. But sometimes she invited people to come in. So as it, Asya Turgenev, and once she said, Miss Marion showed us Dr. Steiner's recent work for the proposed group sculpture, still quite primitive, um, a Christ figure just hinted at the left hand raised towards a falling winged Lucifer, the right extending downward to a writh writhing bad winged Araman the whole 40 centimeter in height, the bits of wood that held the modeling clay together visible everywhere. Then a head of Ariman, in modeled in a simple way, but enormously expressive and dramatic in the power that lay in the planes and is so characteristic of the artist. Miss Marion then showed us the head of the Christ in natural size and worked out in more detail inwardness, like light, which is at the same time also warmth, warmth of soul. This is what felt in looking at this piece of work. It was a gift granted to one, something which lives on when you seek out the memory. Dr. Steiner is not quite satisfied with the position of the head, Miss Marion said. There is some element of pride there, and the Christ does not have anything of the quality of pride. The head will later be turning downward a bit. So this was Asya Turgenev and some original statements of Edith Mary and so work in progress. And we also know that Steiner invited once a priest, it was this Friedrich Rüttelmeier, later the leader of the Christian community who had by inner experience a deep question to Steiner. He was always meditating the, the, uh, the gospel of St. John. And once he came to Steiner and said, Dr. Steiner, um, by in meditating those words of the Christ, I feel that my physical body is not able to take in these words. 